and go on to final preparations. Um, before we do that, one thing I like to do sometimes um, is just to make these files read only because sometimes I accidentally delete them. Um, it's easy to be hammering through and you actually accidentally remove the wrong item, um, remove the source file and you have to go to the pains of downloading it again. So to do that, as you can see, they're all owned uh, or writable by the user. So it's a simple case of doing chone um, minus w. In fact, you can do minus uw specifically on every single file. Uh, sorry, a change mod. Change mode. Why is that not working? Let's just try minus w then. Okay, so you can see now that there's the files previously had read and write access and now they've only got read access. So if I was to remove one of these, um, it would either warn me or, or it would prevent me from deleting the files. So let's move on. So what this does here is going to create a limited directory layout in the LFS system. So if we look at the layout at the moment, all we've got is our sources directory with all these files that we just downloaded in. What this command, well, this first command here, will create a few empty directories that are necessary for a, um, a system. So you can see this bin, you might recognize them, bin, etc. Div, sbin, user, and var. So that one command creates all those directories. The next command, these three lines here, are for 64-bit. Now the default Raspberry Pi operating system is 32-bit, despite the fact that the processor in the um, Raspberry Pi is 64-bit uh, capable. The operating system they supply is still 32-bit because it's a generic one that works across all Raspberry Pi devices. So I've just used that. Um, I believe at the moment they're in the process of making a 64-bit uh, one. Uh, I believe it's available publicly. The beta version is available publicly now. Um, but obviously I've not used that. I'm just using, just using stable stuff. Next, create a tools directory. And this is where all the intermediate tools go that we're going to build prior to, just prior to building the actual LFS system. So the next two or three stages are where we're going to be writing uh, the programs that we compile into this tools directory. And then once that's complete, we'll be using these tools, not the tools on the file on the host system to build the LFS system. So it's an intermediate thing. We've got the host system. We use these tools to build tools in the tools directory. We then, when we've got enough of those tools, we use those tools in this tools directory to build the final system. And that's how we get away from reliance on the host system. So now we're going to add a uh, an LFS user, which is specifically for compiling these tools. So firstly, we're going to add a group for LFS. And then we're going to add the actual user as well. So we've just created a user LFS with its own group LFS. Create a password for it so we can log on with it. And then I'm going to give access to all these directories we've just created to this LFS user so that anything that may need to be written in there can be written in there. Again, this, this bit here is only to do 64-bit. Now, I didn't run it before. You can run it if you want to. It won't do any damage because it checks for the um, architecture. Um, you can see it's got the V flag for, for both. So if it had actually done something, it would have printed it up, but it hasn't printed anything up. So you can see that it hasn't done anything. So it doesn't matter if you do run it, and it doesn't matter if you don't run it. Next, we're going to change the ownership for all of those packages we've just downloaded. 
so that if we now list the files oh sorry it's just the directory I thought it's done the files as well it's only a directory but the Linux from scratch user has got access it's not a root user it's not in the root group but it's in other and it's got read access so I'll still be able to read them um, in fact we wouldn't be able to write them anyway I, I've prevented us from deleting them when we do become root user but as, as another it wouldn't have been able to delete them anyway um, now yes I've experienced this when I was testing this note here in some host systems the following command does not complete properly and suspends the login to the LFS users as a background if the prompt LFS does not appear immediately and the FG command will fix the issue I don't know why this is it whether it's some configuration somewhere but when you run this command Let's see if it does it again. Oh, it hasn't done it now. When I was testing, it did do this. It it, it behaves as if you've um, told the command to run in background and it immediately goes into the background. So this FG command means foreground and it runs the last command that was run in the background. It brings it into the foreground. Um, but for some reason, it's not happened now. Um, that's a bit strange. So as you say, see here, it says that the SU command it instructs us to um, start a login shell with the minus command and become the LFS user. So you can see now we're not root anymore, we're LFS on Raspberry Pi. So now we'll set up an environment for this LFS user. We set some default variables for the home and the terminal. And then some more settings here, um, which are all explained in the text. I'm not going to go through them. Like I say, that's something I advise you to read in your own time. You see, it's all explained there. Now, this bit's important. Um, several commercial distributions add non documented instantiation of etc bash bash rc to the initialization of bash. This file has the potential to modify the LFS user's environment, so it might affect the LFS environment, and we don't want that. So they recommend running this command, and you'll see for this environment it does actually. Okay, yes, it's got to be done as roots. Let's come back out. Oh, what happened there? Oh, for some reason two commands got pasted in, but it looks like it's worked. This is what's happened. There was this bash RC file and it has renamed it so it's not being used. So I'm going to go back to the LFS user. Oh, now it's happened. Now maybe that's what this bash RC does. It does something to stop this happening. So now I've got to press the, or type in the FG to bring that back um, to the foreground. So now we can sort, well, we don't need to do this because we just came out of the LFS, but we can run it anyway. And all that source bash profile does is it rereads these uh, profile config files that we just set. So if you now do set, you'll see some of these things in here. For example, LCO equals POSIX. If we look, there it is there. And LFS is set to MNT LFS and so on. And one thing to note, the LFS target, it's used the current running name um, to create this triplet, even though there's four parts to it. There's now, it used to be just three parts, there's now four parts. It's the architecture, the vendor, the kernel, and uh, I can't remember what this last bit's called now. Um, but there's now four bits to that. So that all looks good. Um, one thing... Um, we do need to do is to make some changes to ensure that the compiler compiles for the correct processor. Um, if I run a command GCC, this command here, this shows how the um, compiler sees the processor 
how it interprets what processor it is. Um, yeah, so if I run that, um, it shows how the compiler was compiled, so what switches were used to compile it, all this stuff here. And then this bit here shows um, what switches it would use if it were to be used to compile another program. Now there's some things here which um, I'm going to reiterate um, and also override. So for example, this floating point part going to override. The march, the architecture is correct. I'm going to go with that. Um, and I'm going to go a bit further and set a tune option as well because um, I've read that if we set the tune option it can improve performance as well so it's not showing that there but if I specify the tune as native uh, M tune sorry you'll see we've got an extra option here where it's shown us the tune, it will be tuned for Cortex A72, which is correct. That's the processor that, that we've got. Um, so I'm going to again be reiterating that. Um, another thing to note is that normally the suffix of the output of this, Normally this would say something like um, x86 or x86-64 Linux GNU. Um, this suffix here is important because I can't remember what the E stands for, uh, extended ABI, I can't remember. But it's a different ABI, so it needs that EABI. The HF is important, that means it's hard float, it means a floating point unit in the processor uses hardware floating point as opposed to software. Um, and you see, um, where is it? Yeah, here it's specifying that the floating point interface has got an ABI which is using the hardware. But we do also need to reiterate that as well to ensure that it doesn't switch back to the floating point um, interface. Um, there's one other command to run to show some useful information. Um, let me see if I can find that. Right, yes, I couldn't remember what the command was, so I've just had to look it up. Um, this one is GCC again, minus C, minus Q, again, march equals native, and help equals target. So what this option does, it shows, because we're cross-compiling and we're, the target of the cross-compile is this ARM processor, um, it's been compiled as a generic not generic, as the previous revision, which is the ARM 7, but we've got an ARM 8, um, as you can see here. Um, uh, an ARM 8 capable processor. So this uh, command shows us what um, options are turned on or disabled for the, the current method of compiling. So basically just doing GCC March equals native. So you can see again the march is correct, that's the one we want. But if we go down to um, tune, you'll see it's empty, it hasn't tuned the code at all, or, or it wouldn't tune the code at all. So if we added the M tune to this line, native to find out how it would see it, you can see again it's, it's um, decided that Cortex A72 is how it's going to tune it, so that's correct. Um, other things to notice, again, the uh, mfloat ABI has set, been set to hard, that's correct. The floating point unit, we can actually improve on that. There's an option um, we shall use. 
which is more appropriate to the ARM V8 and enables the NEON instructions, which are faster. Um, so we'll be overriding that. Um, I think that's about it. This option here is deprecated, so it's not advised to overwrite it. And I noticed when I was doing my testing that the GCC compiler got compiled and this got changed to 32, I think it was. So I'm not sure what significance that has, but that does change. And because it was deprecated, I didn't bother trying to override that. <clears throat> um, I think that's it, really. So what I'm going to do, I don't normally set C flags. These are compiler flags that are sent to the make command, um, but I will do just to ensure that we are getting compiled um, in the best way, <clears throat> i.e. optimised for the Cortex-A72 and to ensure the correct floating point unit is being used. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is modify the... Um, Bash, uh, is it Bash RC? I think it gets red. Yeah. I'm going to put them in here. And what I'm going to do is type in another export command C flags. <coughs> Equals. And first thing I'm going to do is turn on optimization. Optimization level 2. It's a good all round optimization level. Um, being as we're setting C flags, GCC would expect to see an optimization level. It insists if you've altered C flags to specify an optimization level. So this is a fairly good one. The highest level, 03, um, it will take a lot longer to compile. The binaries can, the produced can be bigger. And in certain cases, they can run slower. And they can create code that won't run as well. So it's not as vi advised to run 03 unless you're specifically prepared to look into any problems that might occur. Uh, the next tuning option I'm going to use is pipe. That just enables temporary files um, to be created or, or temporary connections to files to be created in memory rather than uh, on disk. And then we're going to set the architecture to the value that we saw in those GCC commands. So it's ARM V8 dash A, and then if you look at the uh, GCC manual or the documentation, there's a couple of extra features that are turned on. One is a CRC for CRC functions, and the other is for SIMD functions, which obviously accelerate um, uh, multimedia type um, instructions. Then we set the uh, tune command so we set that to cortex a 72 then we want to set the floating point unit remember I said that there's um, a more appropriate selection for the arm v8 and this is neon dash FP dash arm v8 And finally, we want to force the compiler to make sure um, is it minus M float ABI equals hard. We want to ensure it's using the hard hardware floating point system. Um, without that, I found um, that it did try to revert to using the soft in certain places. And then that's for the C compiler. We want to export the same flags for the C++ compiler. So we can do this command, export CXX flags equals C flags, like that. And one other thing, I think it mentions it in a few pages time in the manual, but I'll do it now while I'm here is we can set the make flags variable which indicates to make how many parallel jobs it can run at once and because we're on a four core processor I'm going to set that number of jobs to run in parallel is four so make will 
use this environment variable and act upon it. So I'm going to save that. I'm going to source the bash profile. If I now run set, you can see it's got the C flags and the CXX flags set and we've also got make flags set as well. So let's move on to the next part. This is all about the, um, the units they use to test how long um, each package takes to build, called a standard build unit. And it's, don't use it as a accurate guide it, uh, or an accurate method of timing. It's just a guide really to give you an indication of whether this package is going to be fairly short or fairly long or extremely long. Um, I've noticed compiling over many different machines, um, compiling on this ARM architecture, 32-bit Intel and 64-bit, that some packages can vary wildly depending on on um, which package they are and maybe how you're building it, I don't know. Um, but some of them aren't quite as accurate as you think they might be, so it does vary. Just take, take the um, numbers given as an estimate and even with a pinch of salt, um, don't don't rely on them too religiously, but generally, if it says less than 0.1 of an SBU, it's going to be you know maybe a couple of minutes to do the build from beginning to end for that package. Um, and if it says something like 10 SBUs or 100 even, you know it's going to be maybe half an hour or even several hours to compile. And it explains there if um, a package took 10 minutes to compile um, on the first installed bin utils it take 45 minutes to build at 4.5 SPUs so and as it says my, most of them are short um, there's only a few of the packages that are extremely long uh, there's a bit here with the make flags or you can override the make flags by specifying on the line exactly how many jobs and there are certain packages which will only run on one core um, they fail if you try to run them anymore and like it says here if you do get a failure um, it's sometimes worth just rerunning um, go back and start the build with just one core running see if that's the problem Test suites, um, they're not run at the beginning, but they are run, or it's highly recommended to be run in the uh, chapter 8, the final part, just to prove that you've got code that's working as expected. What you'll find as we go through, um, a lot of the packages initially, especially GCC, uh, have a lot of failures. Um, it scared me a little bit, but when I looked into it, a lot of the failures are down to the fact that we're on ARM technology. So obviously GCC maybe hasn't been optimized or coded specifically uh, or, or isn't as mature for the ARM processors. Um, and when you look at the results online on the GCC page, you'll see a lot of uh, similar errors that uh, we'll see. Um, then there are other errors that are expected that the LFS book knows about. And then there was one or two errors that I couldn't account for, uh, but I carried on anyway. And there were a few more subsequent packages that didn't compile or didn't test correctly. They all compiled all right. Uh, it was the test, some of the tests failed, but I put that down to the fact that A, the book, as, it's, as you saw at the very beginning, has been written for x86 architecture, not ARM. So it could be there are other switches or other options that you'd be tuned to get rid of those errors to stop those errors from occurring or it could be just something unknown or something curious about the uh, ARM architecture that's caused those. Um, so despite the fact that those tests had failures, the compiles all worked and just lightly using the system, I couldn't find anything wrong with it at all. So it did seem to be quite, quite a stable system. Now what it would be like if you went on and did some of the stuff in BLFS, I don't know, but, um, it's just something to bear in mind that if you do decide to use this system on the Raspberry Pi that 
some tests won't won't pass and you may be, end up with a system that's not 100% reliable just some, something to bear in mind you can never be sure until those tests do pass so having said that like I say that everything compiles it's just some uh, little little things that didn't work. We'll see that as we go along. I'll point out uh, where I think the tests uh, can, that fail can be ignored and uh, we'll just carry on right through to the end. 